Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it, and without further ado, let's go. Hello everyone, this happened two months ago, but I only thought of posting it now, warning, it's a little long because I talk too much. First, a little context and backstory. I'm a 19-year-old man. I recently moved to the US from Africa, I will not specify where for safety reasons, to study abroad. In reality, I hoped in America I could find a future where I could truly live as myself. Spoiler alert, I didn't. Not only does it seem like America dislikes trans people as much as Africa, but also, my family here seems to be ten times more strict, closed-minded and traditional than my family back home. For those who don't know, being an international student is expensive. My family is not poor, but we are not wealthy either. So to be able to live here, I needed to move in with my family in America, at least for the time being. Now, to the actual story. A year ago, my cousin graduated from community college and was going to transfer to another university to complete their degree. We are all taking this route because it's cheaper. Naturally, we all had to attend said graduation. And people from immigrant families can probably relate, but my family insisted on being well-dressed, overdressed, for the occasion. I hate dresses with all my heart. I have hated them for as long as I can remember, even long before I realized I was trans. I hate how I look, I hate how they make me feel, and it feels like I'm on the verge of a panic attack every time I'm forced to wear one, especially in public. You can probably tell where this is going. I was forced to wear one for the graduation. You cannot fight or talk back to your elders in my culture, no matter how old you are. I tried to protest as much as possible, but the decision was final. I genuinely wanted to unalive myself that day. Anyways, this year was my graduation. And I knew since last year that the same thing would proceed. My family would ask me what I had to wear for my graduation, and even if I had a perfectly nice suit that was appropriate for the occasion, they'd force me to go dress shopping and wear one to it. But this year, I came prepared. I didn't mention it earlier, but for over a year and a half now, I've been on a weight loss and bodybuilding journey. In fact, the whole incident last year made me double down and work out even harder. Losing weight and building muscle has been a way to help me manage my body dysphoria. Not only do I now look more masculine, but I look pretty cool with muscles too. Like I said earlier, my family is very traditional. So they live by certain gender expectations. One thing they absolutely hate is masculine girls and feminine boys. They hate muscular girls with a burning passion, saying it looks ugly or unnatural. So this year, when they brought up dress shopping for my graduation, I didn't even put up a fight. I went along like nothing was wrong. While dress shopping, I purposely picked the most tight-fitting dresses, sleeveless ones, and even unattractive ones. I've been able to hide my body progress this whole time by only wearing loose and baggy clothes around the house. When it came time to try on the dresses and I came out of the dressing room, the pure look of disgust on their faces is one I cannot describe. I had to try so hard not to burst out laughing in the moment. Mom. Oh my goodness, what have you done to yourself? Aunt, you look so manly, this is not right. Uncle, you need to stop working out so much, it's not ladylike. While I am not the most muscular person out there, I still looked pretty buff in those dresses. Simply put, I looked like a man in those dresses. And they hated that. The worst part is that they could not even complain about my body, because my weight has always been an issue and talking point in my family. So, even though they hated how I looked, at least I lost weight, so they couldn't complain. Cousin, well you have lost weight, that's something. I was even considering spreading my arms wide as I came out of the dressing room. But that might have pushed it too far. Anyway, long story short, they hated every single dress, and allowed me to wear my suit, which I looked much better in. And now, even though I won, I constantly get comments about working out too much from them. Mom. You really should focus on looking more feminine, this is too much. Dad, your body is changing in a way that's not natural for a girl. On the bright side, since I graduated, I am finally moving out after summer, hopefully, with more freedom and less fear, 
things will be different this time. Friend, congrats on graduating and moving out soon. Me, thanks I can't wait to start living on my own terms. Friend, you're really brave for standing up to your family. Me, it wasn't easy but it was worth it. Looking back, this experience has taught me the importance of standing up for myself, even when it's difficult. I hope that by sharing my story, others in similar situations can find the strength to do the same. It all starts with the most infernal of devices at the gym, the treadmill. See, a friend of mine who is basically a professional gym rat told me, dude bro, you gotta up your cardio game. He insisted that a half hour on a treadmill every time I hit the gym would be a good plan. Life pro tip, when someone addresses you as dude bro, seek a second opinion. I did the treadmill thing for a few weeks and then I noticed that anytime I went downhill my knee would say, hey you're a jerk, stop that, this was a problem. I have a dog who likes to go on walks and where I live is not precisely known for its flat terrain. Then it got worse, now it was downhills and stairs, deadlifts, squats, leg press, no problem. Slight downhill, stairs, oh no. Figuring knees aren't something one should ignore and hope will go away, I met with my doctor. She promptly referred me to physical therapy, not a knee brace like I was hoping. I met with the physical therapist. She did an exam and said my quadriceps are weak and need work. I also discovered where my quadriceps are. I was told not to do a lot with my legs at the gym other than biking or swimming. All things being equal, I'll swim. I can swim, but I cannot swim well for very long. It turns out being out of breath and trying to get actual air in isn't as easy as it used to be, especially when some overweight jerk is splashing water all around. Until my lungs catch up with the rest of me, I've adopted what I call the fatty twirl. Four or five strokes of freestyle, roll onto my back, and then kick with my legs until I've got air in me. Then roll back for more and pray I haven't gotten close enough to the edge of the pool to smack my hand into it. I assume I'm doing well because the physical therapist hasn't given me that I am disappointed look, typically reserved for dentists when one has forgotten to floss. But that brings us to yesterday. Normally, I go in the morning, mostly in the interest of avoiding shrieking children while I'm trying to do my thing, but work was nutty and I went later than I usually do. There were clumps of teenagers doing I don't even know what, but they mostly just snickered to each other, and I minded my business. Now the dry part of my routine is done, and it's pool time. I wound up taking a lap lane next to a grandmother in her fifties, who was apparently trying to teach her grandkid, who was ten tops, how to swim properly. I didn't hear a whole lot, seeing as when my ears weren't underwater, there was a fat guy splashing and making a bunch of noise. I could tell the kid was splashing and coughing a lot, which made grandma upset. I didn't pay attention because it wasn't my business and there were lifeguards. I just wanted to get my laps done. I was on an extended period of back float time trying to catch my breath when I was ambushed by a pool noodle. Said noodle was applied directly to my face and not gently. While not painful, a noodle to the noggin is quite startling. I believe the first words out of my mouth were, what the heck, it was grandma wielding the noodle, and she was giving me a very stern look. Grandma, watch your language and stop doing that. Me. What did I do that made you think smacking me with a noodle was a good idea? Grandma, you are swimming stupidly, and my grandson wants to copy you, so you need to stop. After I confirmed that was indeed why I was assaulted with a noodle, I suggested that she might have better luck in the kids' part of the pool. You know, the one over there, far away from me. Grandma, I am just fine here, you are the one causing the problem. Me, thank you for your opinion. I promptly resumed my swim. On my return trip, this woman stepped into my lane and grabbed my ankle. I don't know about the rest of you, but when I'm swimming and something grabs my leg, instant panic response. I immediately started flailing and kicking wildly, trying to free myself. Grandma got herself a nice adrenaline kick right on her forearm. I came up gasping for air and ready to start swinging. I was stopped by the soothing sounds of Grandma wailing about how I just broke her arm. Edit. Her arm was not in fact broken. She wound up with a nasty bruise and that was it. I caught her with the top of my foot. Pro tip. The top of the foot is a bad place to land a kick with. Naturally, 
that's enough to get the lifeguards involved, none of whom were apparently paying attention before she started screaming. Two of them lifted Grandma out of the pool and tried to examine her arm while she was still wailing and flailing. A third gave me static about kicking another guest in the pool. Well, they started to get angry with me until I pointed out where the kicking happened. The poor kid had frozen in place with an expression of abject horror. Once she connected the dots, she realized I wasn't the problem. I told her I was going to go get changed, and then I'd identify myself to the front desk, because if I was going to get interrogated, I'd prefer to be clothed. I did my thing, and by the time I'd showered and changed, there was a manager at the desk apologizing for what had gone on. They reviewed the tapes, and that woman's membership had been terminated. They were very sorry and begged me not to sue. Best interrogation ever. I'm a herpetophile, which means I used to keep and breed reptiles and amphibians. Not only do I know how to take care of lizards and frogs, but I also know how to keep bugs. Because I can't keep large terrariums in my current home, I keep three queen ants. This allows me to build tiny terrariums and will provide good food for dendrobates if I ever get the chance to keep those frogs again. I have a Laceus e. marginatus queen I caught two years ago, and two Campanotus queens I caught today while out grocery shopping. And this is why I almost got arrested. I took a break to smoke a cigarette on a bench near a small park when I spotted two ants that looked like wingless queens looking for a nesting site after their nuptial flight. Most species lose their wings right after mating before building a nest. The only thing I had to catch them with was the clear plastic wrapping of my cigarette packs. In my country, drug dealers often use these same clear plastic wraps as bags to store doses. So I used two of those bags to catch the queens. I had other things to do and couldn't keep them in the bags for too long, since they needed to be placed in artificial nests as soon as possible. I went straight to the pharmacy to buy two test tubes for blood or urine samples, they're used as nests for small ant colonies, and some cotton, it's used to create a water storage on the bottom of test tubes, and as a cork at the opening, preventing the ants from escaping while allowing them to breathe. As soon as I got out of the pharmacy, still holding the bags with the ants, the test tubes and the cotton in my hands, I saw two cops, cop one and cop two, waiting for me. They had seen me walking to the pharmacy with two small clear bags in my hands and got suspicious. Cop 1. Hello there, would you mind explaining to us why you just bought cotton and needles? Me. Well, I'm a herpetophile, I also explained the meaning in detail. And a few minutes ago I caught two queen ants, perfectly legal here by the way. I needed test tubes and cotton to store them. Cop 2, looking at cop 1 and laughing. That's the lamest excuse a junkie could use. Me. Why, are you an expert on making up excuses for being a junkie? Yeah, I got real mad, but cops here are pretty arrogant, and often lie on papers to justify illegitimate arrests, so I don't like them at all. Cop 1. Oh, so you're a comedian too? Me. No, but considering how many jokes there are about cops, I expected you to have some sense of humor. Cop 2. Are you calling us buffoons? Do you want to get charged for insulting officers too, instead of just for possession of drugs? Me showing them the bags with the drugs. First of all, as you can see, there aren't any drugs in those bags. Second, you can also see I didn't buy any needles but two test tubes for blood samples, which along with the two queen ants, should prove to you I'm not getting ready to get high. Third, feel free to check my backpack and the content of my pockets for anything illegal while I write to my lawyer. I'm sure she will be happy to come here and assist me if needed. Last but not least, I wasn't calling you buffoons at all. Buffoons are supposed to have a sense of humor. Luckily, after they checked my backpack and my ID, they went away. I assume threatening to involve a lawyer kept them on the spot, so I got away with no consequences. This has ended up being longer than I thought it would. So bear with me. So this happened many years ago, around 2005, when I was only 10 or 11. This story is based on some fuzzy memories and secondhand info. My family owned a pair of French lop rabbits, brothers named Shadow and Tigger. My older sister and I adored them until the day they died. My year 5 class had show and tell every Friday morning, 
and I got permission from my mum and my primary school, elementary school for you non-UK folks, to take the bunnies in one day. My mum walked me to school, carrying the bunnies in their travel carrier. As we entered the playground, she handed me the carrier and told me to get my teacher to let me into the classroom early to place them behind her desk. We said our goodbyes, she gave me a kiss, the usual stuff, and she told me she'd be back in an hour to pick up the bunnies after show and tell was over. She then began walking home. There was no reason to think anything would go wrong. It was still a good five or ten minutes until we were allowed in, and I couldn't see my teacher through the windows. I didn't think to knock, so I just set the carrier down and stood beside it, waiting. Inevitably, my bunnies caught the attention of many children on the playground, and soon a small crowd was cooing over them. This one kid, Jake, from a couple of year groups below me came up to me and asked me to let them out. Obviously, I said no, they were surrounded by unfamiliar people. They would be scared and try to run away, and catching them would be very difficult. Not to mention, I didn't know this kid at all. Year groups didn't mix much at my school, and I don't think he'd been there very long. Jake didn't like my answer and tried to let them out himself, but he didn't know how to open the carrier. I didn't say anything to him about this, but I did put my foot in front of the door. He gave up and ran off. I thought that was the end of it, but it was just the beginning. A few moments later he came back with his mother, Karen in tow. He pointed at me, and I felt her gaze fall upon me. She turned to Jake, smiled and nodded and said something to him. He yelled yay and ran off again, I think to his friends. I don't know if it was my Asperger's or just me being naive. But I thought he simply showed his mum the rabbits and asked her if they could get their own one day, and that she had said yes. I thought that right up until she walked up to the carrier, picked it up, and walked away with it. I just stood there for a moment, stunned and unsure of what to do, before I ran after her. When I caught up with her, the following exchange, if you could call it that, went something like this. Me. Excuse me miss, can I have my bunnies back please? Karen. Ignores me. Me. Miss, those are my bunnies, may I please have them back? Karen. Continues ignoring me. Seeing that conversation was going nowhere, I grabbed the pet carrier and stood fast. Me. Give back my bunnies, I need to take them to show and tell. Karen stopped, looked down at me, and then ripped the carrier out of my grasp with enough force that I cried out in pain, but I also heard a squeal from the carrier itself. She hurt my bunnies, but what she did next sticks with me to this day. She turned around, grabbed my shirt front with her free hand, got right in my face, and with a scowl, voice and expression combo that could curdle fresh milk, she said to me, Karen, they're not yours anymore. She then shoved me back, making me fall flat on my butt. I wasn't hurt, but I was shocked, scared, and the enormity of the situation got to me. I started crying, like properly bawling. I thought I had done something wrong, and that I was never going to see Shadow and Tigger again. Everything's a bit of a blur to me from this point, but I remember another parent coming up to me and asking what was wrong. I pointed at Karen, wailing, she's taking my bunnies away. I was rescued, fortunately, by my mum. She hadn't actually gone home yet. She told me what happened from her perspective, though not what was said. She had run into the parents of one of my friends, friend's mom and friend's dad, and struck up a conversation. The first thing she knew that something was wrong was when friend's mom gasped. She looked over and saw Karen holding our carrier, pushing me to the floor. Instantly, she entered angry, protective mother bear mode and ran right up to Karen, with friend's mom and friend's dad in tow. Karen tried to run, but a teacher, Tom, who saw everything stopped her in her tracks. My mom screamed at her, demanding to know what she was doing, stealing my bunnies and attacking me. Karen tried to claim that I was trying to take her rabbits, to which friend's mom called lies and asked why she brought her rabbits to the school. Karen went full screaming banshee, spewing stuff like, my son wants these rabbits and that boy didn't care about them, he wouldn't let them stretch their legs. She started swinging the carrier around violently, screaming that if her son couldn't have them, no one could. She tried to smash the carrier against a pillar. Before that happened, Mum and friend's mom grabbed the carrier and pulled it out of her grip. Friend's dad, a judo instructor, managed to pin Karen, who was still kicking, screaming and spitting. 
Tom ran to the office to call the police while Karen continued trying to justify her actions. Police obviously wanted proof of who owned the bunnies, so it was a good thing that among the things I brought with the bunnies were several pictures of them, including one with me in it. Karen realized she'd messed up big time and started crying herself. Mum said it was the most pathetic thing she'd ever seen. The aftermath. Karen was put in cuffs and taken to the station. Mum took the rabbits to the vet immediately. I stayed at school with teachers who calmed me down. Karen was an addict, a known violent addict. She was high on illegal substances at the time and had more illegal substances in her purse. But the real kicker is that she already had rabbits at home, rabbits she wasn't allowed to have since she had a track record of animal abuse and neglect, rabbits that were dying because of yet more neglect. Karen ended up spending a few years in prison for this. My mum doesn't know much beyond this. Jake stopped showing up one day. I don't know what happened to him, and I don't care. He probably went to live with other family. I was shaken, but fine. She didn't injure me, just caused pain. I ended the day much happier, especially when I learned Shadow and Tigger were just a bit bruised but otherwise fine. They didn't seem traumatized at all. They continued to live their little lives like nothing had happened. They died in June 2009, and I miss them a lot but this is one memory of them that I would rather forget. I hope you can see why. And that's where this enormous tale ends. I used to work at a popular coffee chain in Canada one where the owners could buy stores and decide what to sell but still had to follow some rules. The place always had a sign out reading, hiring all positions, red flags from the start, but my sister and I needed jobs. It was close to home and our first gig, so we decided to give it a shot. One of the main things that got people in trouble was giving customers free ice water in a to-go cup. Our training from the head office said we should do this, but every time the owner caught us, she would take one dollar out of the tip jar. It didn't stop there. If we used more than three washcloths, and you need a lot with all the spills, gave people paper plates even if they were eating in store, or put more than one napkin in to-go bags, she would deduct money from our tips or paychecks. Both of these practices are illegal, by the way. The breaking point came one night when I had to stay an hour later to clean a station that wasn't mine, I didn't get paid for the overtime or the extra hour. That was it for me. I decided to do everything I could to cost her money without getting caught. I have swift hands from learning magic in school, so I started to give customers more than what they ordered. I'd put 30 donut holes in a box meant for 20. If you ordered a small coffee, oops, I made it a large. Double cheese and meat for everyone, your small soup, sorry, it's a large now. I did anything I could to cost her money. The best part, you couldn't see me doing this on the cameras. She'd watch the footage and try to find out where the stuff was going, but I was too slick, too smart and unstoppable. I felt power and I wanted more. I got others involved. Every night at 2 a.m. we had to throw everything out. I'd get a new clear bag, put all the baked goods in it, and set it by the back door just outside. Then I'd call some friends to come by and steal $80 worth of baked goods. The owner got a bonus for good drive through times, so we'd have someone park in the drive through to mess up the times. I served my time and covered my tracks. Snow on the license plates of the friends who helped, ski masks and winter clothing to disguise them, magic hands, I did it all. I wanted her to lose money. She was furious. She called us all out, cursing and swearing in front of the store. My sister and I had enough and filed our two weeks notices. We did what we could but needed to get out. Guess what happened next? Customers started filing complaints, ex-workers filed complaints, and undercover investigations were launched to figure out why that one location was such a disaster. In the end, the owner was banned from her own property, and her son had to take over. So now, not only can she not manage her own property, but the place still runs poorly because of her terrible management. I probably didn't cost her a fortune, but I felt so happy and proud that I took action. Looking back, it felt good to stand up to someone who was treating us unfairly. It wasn't just about the money, it was about the principle. We all deserve to be treated with respect and dignity, and I wasn't going to let her walk all over us. In the end, she got what she deserved, 
and I walked away knowing I had made a difference. About 15 years ago, I worked in the highly regulated area of inbound mortgage sales in the UK. Our calls were monitored for compliance, and multiple failed calls led to action plans being put in place to get you back on track. I had a terrible start to the year, and failed three calls in a row. The usual follow-up and support didn't happen, but I turned things around and passed the next four months of calls with no action plan needed. In month four, I got called into a meeting to discuss my need for an action plan. I was confused since it had been so long since I had failed a call. I was referred back to the calls from the start of the year. I mentioned that I felt the action plan was unwarranted, as I had turned things around myself even without the support, and putting me on an action plan now was definitely closing the stable door after the horse had bolted. I was told that this was non-negotiable. Okay, fair enough. The action plan was drawn up, and there was a section for my comments. I stated the dates of my failed calls, the record since the last failed calls, and my disappointment that the support was not offered at the time of need. I was told I wasn't allowed to record this on the performance plan. What they didn't realize at the time is how petty I am. So I researched the HR handbook, printed out the sections stating explicitly that I was allowed to put any information I wanted in this section. I updated the performance plan to state that I had been told I couldn't record my objections, the manager who told me that, and added the HR handbook section for good measure. Well, it turns out we were due for an inspection, and not intervening when there is a record of failed calls was a big issue. My diverting the lack of support back to management would not look good. They would not sign off my plan as it stood, and I would not back down either. The result was I was not allowed to do my job. I was already job searching elsewhere, but I managed to spend three months being paid to job search and be available for ad hoc tasks. This mostly ended up with me playing Mario Kart in the break room until busy work could be found elsewhere. When I eventually gave my notice, I was immediately put on a month's paid leave to get me out as soon as they could. One day, while I was enjoying my Mario Kart session, my colleague Lisa walked in. Lisa, hey, what are you doing in here? Me, just waiting for some busy work to come my way. You, Lisa, oh, just grabbing a coffee. Did you hear about the inspection coming up? Me, yeah, I heard. Should be interesting, especially with how they've been handling things lately. Lisa, you mean your action plan situation? Me, exactly. They tried to put me on an action plan for calls I failed months ago, even though I've been passing everything since then. Lisa, that's ridiculous. Did you tell them that? Me. I did but they said it was non-negotiable. So I made sure to include my objections and the HR handbook section in my comments. Lisa. Good for you. They need to be held accountable too. A few days later, my manager called me into his office. Manager. We need to discuss your performance plan again. Me, sure, what's up, manager? We can't sign off on it as it stands, your comments are problematic. Me, I don't see how, I followed the HR handbook to the letter. Manager, it reflects poorly on management, especially with the inspection coming up. Me, maybe if the support had been offered when it was needed, we wouldn't be in this situation. Manager, look, we need to find a way to resolve this. Me, I'm not backing down. If you want to resolve this, acknowledge the mistake and let's move on. Manager, we can't do that. Me. Then we have a problem. The standoff continued, and I was effectively sidelined. Instead of doing my regular job, I was given busy work, which often meant I was just sitting around waiting for something to do. It was a frustrating but oddly liberating experience. Eventually, I found a new job. When I handed in my notice, they immediately put me on a month's paid leave to get me out of there as soon as possible. On my last day, I bumped into my manager in the hallway. Manager. So today's your last day, huh? Me. Yep, finally moving on. Manager. Well, good luck with everything. Me. Thanks. Hopefully you'll handle things better with the next person. Manager, we'll see. And with that, I walked out of the office, relieved and ready for a fresh start. The whole experience taught me a lot about standing up for myself and the importance of proper support and communication in the workplace. Looking back, I'm glad I didn't back down and that I took a stand for what was right.
I live in a very tenant-friendly area. We have rent control, and landlords are not allowed to do things like demand security deposits, enter the property without proper written notice, or include no pet clauses in leases, which renew automatically every month after a fixed term ends. For the last 11 years, my husband and I have had a great relationship with our landlord, Joe. Fake name. We've been very lenient in regards to repairs, and Joe was very forgiving when my husband and I both lost our jobs at the same time in 2016 and fell a few months behind on rent. We are now ahead on rent, but Joe is still very behind in maintenance and repairs. We have a whole laundry list of issues my landlord is aware of but hasn't done anything about for years. We didn't care because he left us alone and has been overall very kind to us. A few years ago, our landlord allowed us to start storing stuff in an old, run-down shed behind our rented portion of the yard. We never stored anything valuable out there because it's falling apart, and squirrels have been using it to cache walnuts from the numerous walnut trees in our yard. We had an old barbecue, lawnmower, ladders, and outside toys for my kids in there, until recently. A few months ago, Joe showed up asking about the shed, wanting to know what we had stored out there. I told him, just some old junk we'll probably throw out soon. He told us that the family next door has a mouse problem, we don't, and he wants us to clear out the shed to prevent issues, and because, I want it to look nice around here. I said, okay, I'll talk to my husband and we'll get it cleared out whenever we get a chance. I have an infant at home so I can't go out back and clean it out myself unless someone else is here to watch the baby. My husband had scheduled surgery so he wasn't able to do any heavy lifting until after he recovered. Admittedly, cleaning out the old shed was not a high priority. Then, Joe sent me a passive-aggressive text. I just wanted to remind you that tomorrow is garbage day. We know, garbage pickup has always been on Monday, and we need to work together to keep the rental property nice for everyone to enjoy. I replied asking him if he had plans to fix the shed, remove his scrap pickup truck, or remove his open compost piles and heaps of mixed concrete and scrap metal he has out by the shed he wants us to clean. I also explained that my husband just had surgery, and that we weren't planning on cleaning the shed that day. Read it he did not like that. He showed up unannounced, walked inside, and proceeded to yell at us in front of our kids. He complained about his personal finances and the economy. Inflation, property taxes. Swore at us about our freaking stuff, told us we can't use the shed anymore, and threatened to evict us because, clearly you don't like living here, and I can get way more for this house than what you're paying now. We told him to leave, and that we will not communicate with him anymore unless in writing. He said, fine, we'll do it all by the book from now on, and stormed out. The next day he put an eviction notice in our mailbox complaining that we have excessive garbage and waste in outbuildings and that we refused to discuss this issue in corrective action with the landlord, and even added that he felt it was unreasonable, given the fact that he didn't evict us for late rent back in 2016. The notice gave us seven days to correct the issues, or else my landlord could file for an eviction hearing. The next day, while I cleaned out everything belonging to us, minus the walnuts and squirrel droppings, from the shed, my husband got busy contacting local bylaw, and the Rental Housing Enforcement Agency, Traffic Cops for Landlords. He was given information on how to file against the landlord for refusing to do repairs, illegal entry, loss of an amenity, the shed, and harassment. After a surprise inspection that happened last week, we were given a report that said Joe was given 90 days to fix the roof, plumbing, and weeping tile. He must demolish the shed and either erect a new shed or give us a rent reduction because the shed was an assumed amenity. According to my neighbors with the mouse issue, the provincial government is also involved now because apparently he filled in a pond without a permit, and now the fire department doesn't have a nearby water source in case of a fire. No hydrants out here. The city, by law enforcement, threatened to fine him for every day that he leaves his large pile of broken concrete and rebar out back. The cherry on top happened yesterday. He sent me a text to tell me that he and the plumber were going to be there within the hour. Normally, I'd be okay with short notice, 
despite the law saying he must provide 24-hour written notice. Not this time. I told him we need 24-hour notice. He showed up, knocked on the door, and when I reminded him that I won't speak to him in person anymore, he called the police saying that I was being hostile towards him, and he doesn't feel safe coming here. He sat outside for four hours waiting for the police who later called me instead of showing up. The officer who called said that Joe was told to stop harassing us and that he needs to provide 24-hour notice to enter the home. He wanted to make sure Joe left and gave proper notice and asked me if I wanted an officer there tomorrow to keep the peace. If Joe doesn't do the repairs he's supposed to, we plan to take him to court and file for a rent reduction and for a lien to be put on the property so he can't just sell it. We're just doing it by the book from now on, and just want it to look nice. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences and opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.